On Larry King Now, John Mulaney. I started wearing a suit when I was about uh, 27 because I got on stage in a flannel shirt and jeans. The whole audience was my age and looked just like me. You know, a lot of young guys who look like Lee Harvey Oswald. I said, there's no reason I should have a microphone, so I better dress up and, you know, look like I have authority. Is it true that you'd add to the script between the dress rehearsal and the taping? I did, yes. But only because the first time we did it, Bill Hader started laughing. And Bill's a real professional. He's from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So he's like, he assaulted the earth, you know, he wants to do a good job and stuff. So I said, well, I want to derail all of that. So I would add new lines to trip him up and make him laugh. As president, in the current situation, it feels like there's a horse loose in a hospital. <laughs> I am an optimist. I think eventually everything will be OK, but I have no idea what's going to happen next. Plus, I understand, I'm told this, that you do a decent Mick Jagger. So I do a tiny impression of him in this new special. But it was more about how he's authoritative, you know, because he's done stadiums for 50 years. So he's not ever gonna be like, um, do you have a laptop charger I can borrow, you know? He just goes, yes, now, yes. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our guest today is Emmy-winning stand-up comedian, actor, writer, and producer John Mulaney, whose diverse resume includes writing for Saturday Night Live, creating and starring in his semi-autobiographical series, Mulaney, a stint on Broadway in the much-beloved Oh, Hello, which John starred opposite Nick Kroll. He also wears a suit like nobody's business. John's latest Netflix special is Kid Gorgeous, and it's available now, and I was happy to do the promo for this special. Why did you choose me? to do that promo. There was no one else on the list. It was Larry King or Silence. Why? I wanted the authority of New York City. <laughs> I know you've been based here for a while, but <laughs> you're the authority of New York City. And I wanted that tone, I wanted the Larry King tone to sell uh, the special. I, I, I didn't want to do a lot of work personally on the comedy. I needed you to sell it for me. I sold it, didn't you I? You punched every word. OK. You talk about being in the gross phase yeah. Between young and old. What yeah. are, are you... How do you look at yourself? I, I recognize that I still look a little young. I feel much older inside. And I also have noticed that things are starting to go. And I have a beautiful wife who will point out those things that are going. Uh, my eyebrows are getting out of control. Uh, yeah. I have hair on my shoulders. I don't even do. have a joke for that. <laughs> you don't have to. That's just going to lay there right there, yeah. <laughs> you, you were the only stand-up to be a writer on Saturday Night Live, right? Well... No, you two others. Conan? Conan, Larry David Larry was David. a big stand-up. There, there have been lots of stand-ups that have written there over time. You know, even Alan Zweibel started as a stand-up comic. Did he? Even, even Al Franken and Tom Davis, they had a two-man act they did in clubs. So there were a lot of people that came from that background. Alan Zweibel, very funny. The funniest and yeah. the nicest. Always takes me to the Friars Club. Yeah, it's where he hangs out. I'm it, the dean. What does that mean? I, I'm, in, I'm the head man at the Friars. You are? Yeah. You what are your responsibilities? Nothing. Yes. It's just, <laughs> just make sure the food's boiled a little bit. I just past. go and I'm, uh, I'm the dean. Oh, wow. You always wear a suit. Is that a throwback to the old comedians? Cosby always wore a suit. Alan King always wore a suit. Well, I don't, I don't so much uh, use Cosby as a reference anymore. <laughs> um, you never come out in jeans, right? Uh, I, I did last night because um, I just was doing a short set. I like to wear a suit once I have a lot of good stuff prepared. Otherwise, I feel like I'm just selling the suit. I started wearing a suit when I was about uh, 27 because I got on stage in a flannel shirt and jeans. The whole audience was my age and looked just like me. You know, a lot of young guys that look like Lee Harvey Oswald. And they're all wearing <laughs> a, a flannel shirt and jeans. And I said, there's no reason I should have a microphone, so I better dress up and, you know, look like I have authority. What was the short thing you did last night? I just did a, a short little bit of stand-up over at this theater called Largo at the Coronet. Why? Uh, because I just had a special come out, I burned all that material, and I need new material. So I'm working on it right now. So you tested it last night? Tested some new stuff last night. How long is a short set? I did 20 minutes. I was supposed to do 10. 
give me an example of one of the things you did last night. Uh, Test it on me. All right. This is, I'll do a newer one that works. Okay. A lot of these uh, men are calling the uh, accusations against them a witch hunt. And I don't, I don't love that term. I don't know if you've read The Crucible lately, but it doesn't end with half a dozen embarrassed millionaires <laughs> who just take six months off work before they come back in Daddy's Home 3. Very hip. I got a big laugh over there. Yeah, on, you got a big record, laugh from yeah. me. Do you think a wardrobe influences a comedian set? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the first time I wore a suit was for a special I did in... 2012 called New in Town, and I suddenly felt like for some reason this has given me some authority. You feel authoritative. I feel authoritative. You have to be because what I'm talking about is nonsense. I'm exasperated over <laughs> pointless topics, so I might as well look like, you know, I'm in charge. Do you feel funny in a suit? Uh, I feel like it's funny that I'm wearing a suit, that I think I deserve to be better dressed than the audience is inherently funny to me. I like this, like your ensemble today. Nice little polka dot tie, beautiful gray, off a wonderful blue. Thank you. This is a wool suit. It's a little warm outside. Yeah. I'm happy to be in air conditioning. But you are the sartorial king, and so I... I you like suspenders? Why don't you... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm about to make the move to suspenders. They feel good. They feel good. No more belts. Yeah. Or Sansa belt, which I've never cared for. <laughs> Our guest is the great stand-up comedian John Mulaney. We're discussing how he managed to build a stand-up career while writing for Saturday Night Live. And the beauty of Stefan. After the break, stay with us. We're back with the great John Mulaney. His latest Netflix special is Kid Gorgeous, and it's available now. Do I sell that? Look at that. That was beautiful. Okay, you returned with Bill Hader to write a Stefan sketch. You even had a line about me. It was, gosh, you went to some New York restaurant and it has a familiar yet trouble, trouble feeling like when Larry King plays himself in a movie. Yes. Because I've done 23 movies. 23? 23, always play myself, except for, for the, the, what I do a voiceover with. I did Billy Crystal, I did the B movie. Yes, you did. Now, the first time I was ever introduced to the great Larry King was in Ghostbusters. That was my first movie. That was your first movie. You nailed it. I mean, you, saw, it, you made it real to all of us. I did the first scene they shot. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You really, you really make it feel like there are ghosts out there that need to be busted because <laughs> we trust Larry King. <laughs> Stefan. How did Stefan... Give me the history how Stefan came about. Well, Stefan was a character that Bill Hader and I... We wrote a lot together when I was there for the five years I was a writer. And... It was a character that was kind of based on, uh, do you remember the Peter Gation area, era in New York, uh, club kids? This was during Rudy Giuliani. They're trying to shut down a lot of clubs. I ecstasy. Wasn't did you ever yet. take ecstasy? They're trying to. No, I never did. <laughs> they're trying, it's really great. You got to try it. <laughs> uh, this was one of these sort of downtown club kid characters. We did a couple uh, sketches, meaning a, a set and other actors, and it wouldn't quite work. Then we put him at the update desk, and he just gave tourist tips with some of the most bizarre things you could go to in New York. And I so thought it would not work, and it worked very well right away. And it became a big phenomenon, which to this day baffles me. You wrote all of them? Uh, Bill Hader and I co-wrote all of them. Is it true that you'd add to the script between the dress rehearsal and the taping? I did, yes. But only because the first time we did it, Bill Hader started laughing uh, during the segment on air. And that's a lot of fun, but you never want to force a fake laugh in right. the moment, right? It's cheap. So I thought this was very special, and Bill's a real professional. He's from Tulsa, Oklahoma, so he's like, he assaulted the earth, you know, he wants to do a good job and stuff. So I said, well, I want to derail all of that. So I would add new lines to trip him up and make him laugh. Were they all, all read off a of prompter? I would tell him, you know, with cue cards, you can't, see it for the first time on air. So right before he'd walk out, I'd say, this is in, this is in, this is in. Just so he could be a little familiar, but not yet get over it so that he'd laugh on air. As an in-person act, yes. was it hard to be behind the scenes as a writer? Uh, no, not at Saturday Night Live. Because, because? when you're a writer, you're, uh, you have the run of the place. Uh, well, there's a boss, Lauren Michaels. He has the run of the place. But when you're a writer, you're not just a writer, you're a producer. 
you get to uh, work with the costume department, the set design department, the props department. So in about one year when I was 25, I learned more about TV production than I ever could anywhere else. And you really had so much control that com not, I loved writing for this amazing cast. I also knew I could never be as good as that cast, but the actual writing and producing is so rewarding that uh, I would have never traded jobs. What was it like to come back and host? Scary. Very scary. Why? Because uh, I'd always been behind the scenes. I, I was like the, the Russian people putting dogs into uh, spaceships and shooting them off and going, have fun. And now they, I was the dog, and they're, you know, the cosmonauts are stuffing me in there. And I was like, oh, I remember what we used to do to these dogs. Um, and then I got there and had one of the best weeks of my life. Not to be Frank Capra-esque, but it was like, it's a wonderful life. I looked back and I said, this was the f most fun five years of my life working here. You remembered all of it. I remembered all of it, and I remembered all of the amazing... I don't like when people say the crew. That sounds like this, you know, one, one guy who's, you know, just hauling rope. It's made up of Tony Award-winning designers, uh, costume designers, artisans, painters, carpenters, editors, uh, the makeup and hair department. Working with all those people was the greatest joy of it. Did you do any of the writing? Uh, when I hosted, yes. For skits, too? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm too much of a control freak to not do that. Yeah. I wrote uh, a piece with my dear friends Simon Rich and Merica Sawyer uh, that was called Switcheroo. And then I wrote, uh, and these were all sketches we had written when I was a writer. I resubmitted them now that I had the clout. <laughs> my friend Colin Jost and I wrote a sketch called Lobster Diner about someone who orders the lobster. You know when you get a diner menu and it's 10 laminated pages and there's always lobster dinner? Someone orders the lobster, and then we had a big musical about that. Uh, you come from an academic family, right? You're, both your parents went to Yale. Georgetown, then Yale Law School, yes. Both of them? Yes, but they went to Yale because it was the best law school, not because they were following each other, my dad is always quick to point out. Did you grow up in Washington? No, we grew up in Chicago, where my dad's from, in the city. So yeah, that was after Yale? That was after, yeah, that was after Yale. They were both lawyers. Um, and my mother's from the Boston area. They settled in Chicago. My dad was an attorney. My mother's a law professor. My brother's a U.S. attorney, and I'm a stand-up. Your brother's a U.S. attorney? Yes. Where? Chicago. Tough. That's a that's a tough office. It's a very Fitzgerald. Tough job. Fit, uh, Pat Fitzgerald. Uh, no longer there. But no, yes. but he was a tough U.S. attorney. Oh yeah, everyone in Chicago is tough. So you can imagine what the U.S. attorneys have to be. <laughs> Uh, but wow. he has a he has an actually important, difficult life. So of the intellectual side of the family, you're on the low run. Well, I have a sense of superiority. However, uh, no, I have never proven myself in that arena. I mean, you look, your brother's a U.S. attorney, your father's attorney, Yale, your mother, Yale, you could come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. John. Yeah, well, I went to Georgetown, too. You did? I did, but I got in because of uh, the help of a friend of mine. Uh, I'll never forget his name. It was Dad. <laughs> was uh, I? I lived in Washington for twenty years and I spent a lot of time in Georgetown. Where in Washington did you live? McLean, right oh, outside. Yeah. Was Georgetown equal to its reputation? What's its reputation? Man. Fantastic. It is fantastic. Yes. Well, I'm telling you, was it equal to its reputation? Absolutely. You okay, we, John? Don't act so mad. I well, don't. I don't know what its reputation is. Its reputation is great. Well, we do a lot of other stuff there besides great things, so I never knew what you were referring to. But you'd live in a you live in a dumpy row house, and two doors down would be Madeleine Albright. You know, <laughs> you'd be walking a class, and you'd see George Tenet. You know? um, it was a fun uh, era to be in Washington D.C. They were arguing Bush v. Gore my freshman year. It was very stimulating. Now I, of course, didn't go into any of those fields. Everyone was everyone was a government major or in the School of Foreign Service. Well, I was living in Washington. Bush versus Gore. I was on the air every night. That was. You, you went to the hearings. I, was, I didn't go to hearings. They had open... I know. Yeah. My, my friend got up on a table and Rehnquist went, hey, get down from there. <laughs> That's one of his proudest accomplishments. <laughs> Rehnquist v. Table. <laughs> Coming up, John on Mick Jagger, Fan Encounters, and his longtime friend and collaborator Nick Kroll. More with Mr. Kid Gorgeous after this. John Mulaney, you just told me you spent one year in college with Ivanka Trump. Yes, I she did. She went to Georgetown? Yeah, we were both freshmen at the same time. Yeah. You remember her? Yeah, she was in my Euro Civ class. 
uh, where we studied uh, uh, pre-Renaissance Europe. Was uh, she good? She was very nice, a good student. Um, and we all smoked cigarettes, so I'd see her out on the patio. Oh, really? Oh, do I get sued for that? She smoked. You smoke. You know you smoked, Ivanka. And we'd all <laughs> smoke out on the patio. She's very, very nice. And uh, and I, she left uh, after one year, and I thought, well, that's the last I'll ever see of her. <laughs> Little did I know. Eric <laughs> went there, too. Oh, did he? Uh, you do a bit about Trump in your act, and you liken him to a horse let loose in a hospital. Explain. As president, in the current situation, it feels like there's a horse loose in a hospital. <laughs> I am an optimist. I think eventually everything will be okay, but I have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> and no one knows what the horse is going to do, least of all the horse. He's never been in a hospital before. Tell me about Oh Hello. You played an elderly man you did it with, with your friend Mr. Kroll, right? Who's yes. been a guest on this show? Yes, yes. I loved his interview with you. Did you like the Broadway scene? I loved it more than anything. How long did you do it? We did it, um, we did off-Broadway for about uh, two months, and our Broadway run, run was from September to January. Was it a limited run? It was a limited run, and we did that in case it didn't work. <laughs> Was it, it was fun every night? It was fun every night because it reminded me of Saturday Night Live. You're doing a live show. You're in New York. You're in Midtown. And also, instead of being on tour, which I normally am, everyone comes to visit you. And it's just rare air to be on Broadway. I'm told by every Broadway actor, every night's different. Oh, absolutely. And we would have a guest every night, and we'd do 20 minutes improvise with them. Martin Short did that. I went on stage with him. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, he had an improvised interview every night in his show. Oh, you did the Jiminy Glick. Uh, uh, yeah, we yeah. did yeah, Jiminy Glick, and well, I had him as Jiminy Glick on my show. I remember that. We stole Marty's idea, and then we did it on Oh Hello. And then we would improvise another 10 minutes at the show. So we always knew we could make it fresh. Yeah. You did. You made money. Uh, we broke even. Okay. Only the Broadway world brags when they've broken even. <laughs> We play, we play a game of if you only knew. We just throw questions at you. Okay. Guilty pleasure. Mine? Yeah, who else? You ought to guess. How revealing am I supposed to be? Anything you want to say. Well, I, as I say to my wife, I don't smoke anymore, but I smoke cigarettes. So you lie to her? I, I smell, I reek of them. I, I, I charmingly smoke? miss Why them. Why do you still smoke? I smoked for 30 years, had a heart attack, stopped. Well, I've only smoked since I was 13, and I'm 35, so only 22 years. Oh, you're all right. I'm all right, yeah. <laughs> Person you trade places with for a day. Let's see. Uh, it would have been Ed Koch, uh, mayor of New York City. I, I wish I had more of that in me. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Just con was, confrontational. Ed was unbelievable. Yeah. Be because I so want to give people what they want <laughs> that watching him just go, you're never, you're crazy if you think you're going to get that. How am I doing? How am I doing? Well, you're pissing a lot of people off. Eh? <laughs> the comedian that made you want to pursue comedy. Uh, in truth, Jerry Seinfeld. Great. Yeah. Truth. There are many other influences, but I saw his documentary comedian when I was a sophomore in college, and I said, oh, this, this is a real life, you know? I can really do this. Secret talent. Secret talent. I can turn my feet around pretty much all the way. I can stand perfectly uh, in, in ballet first position, and then I can turn them all the way around. But this is how I tore my hip, so. Who? Uh, also, I can sing unless you ask my wife, and then I can't sing. Saturday, do you have children? Uh, no, we have a dog. What's the dog's name? Petunia, the French bulldog. Oh, they're ugly, aren't they? What? They're that, gorgeous. That face. Yeah, they got those little Paul Giamatti faces. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Saturday Do you night, have any children? I have, I have three grown and I have two teenagers. Three grown and two teenagers. How are the teenagers? 19 and 18 and both baseball players. Both very good baseball players. Really? Did you play baseball? No, I loved it, though, but I, I wasn't a good athlete. But they Neither are. was I. I was a terrible athlete. I'm afraid if I had children, they'd be good athletes. Are you a Cub fan? Yes, north side of the city. Saturday Night Live character of yours that feels most like you? Um, Riley, a character I wrote with Fred Armisen that made it to the air once. He was a little boy uh, who kind of talked like Harvey Firestein, and he would go, <laughs> get out of my way, bitch. And uh, he just was all a, 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 an authoritative 
eight-year-old flamboyant kid. Childhood celebrity crush. Jean Triplehorn. Who is she? Jean Triplehorn, the great actress. Dated Tom Cruise for a while. She was in Waterworld. Waterworld bombed. Doesn't mean. <laughs> doesn't mean. Okay. I couldn't fantasize about Funniest it. Funniest fan encounter. Funniest fan encounter. Someone came up to me during this tour and said, I've, I'm a huge fan. I saw you at the Vic once in Chicago on acid. And I th thought, I don't seem like an act you should see on acid. <laughs> it's like going to see Mitt Romney speak on acid. <laughs> Try to pick something more psychedelic as opposed to a plain slice of white bread in a suit talking. What never fails to make you laugh? Um, people who... Uh, take themselves seriously, um, and people who are lying but bad at it. That's my favorite thing in the world. Do you, can you give me a person that might be that way? That, that it lies but is bad at it? Um, let's see. I'm going to out some friends of mine. I'll tell you another thing. People who refuse to say they're wrong. That all, oh. I love that. Uh, not that Lauren Michaels is ever wrong, <laughs> but if he ever is, like if I were to say... That's a nice red shirt. And you said, it's a blue striped shirt. He'd go, no, I know. <laughs> I understand, I'm told this, that you do a decent Mick Jagger. Oh, I, I don't know if I do a decent I Mick I interviewed Jagger. Mick, so why don't you answer a question as him? Uh, please ask a question. Why do the stones keep on going? Oh, down now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, you stayed on top of Come so on now. I don't look in the past. I like people that don't look in the past. <laughs> you know, people are all about moving forward. All I do is sit and dwell in the past. <laughs> Mick keeps going. I worked with him, uh, so well, yeah. I do a tiny impression of him in this new special. But it was more about how he's authoritative, you know, because he's done stadiums for 50 years. So he's not ever going to be like, um, do you have a laptop charger I can borrow, <laughs> you know? He just goes, yes, now, yes. And he went to the London School of Economics. He did? Yeah. Oh. Graduated the London School of... Not good for his street cred. What are you bad at? Everything but stand-up comedy, and sometimes I'm bad at that. <laughs> I'm not a household person. I can't change a light, let alone a recessed light. Don't get me, me started. Either. Those right. things stay burnt out. If you could speak to an animal, what animal would you choose un un unlike not a dog, other than a dog? Other than a dog or my dog, what animal would I talk to? Uh, I, I, I think a walrus. A walrus? Yeah, I'd go, why the mustache? Yeah, that's a good question. Why do they have mustache? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> One of the few animals that just has a mustache. One thing you'd like to change about the world? Uh, less assholes. <laughs> and I don't just mean some of the newly revealed uh, perverted assholes. Just less assholes in general. Something you long believed to be true and realized wasn't. Um, let's see. Uh, for a long time when I was a kid, I thought adults knew what they were talking about. <laughs> and then uh, when Whitewater happened, uh, I, I thought, oh, None of you have any idea what you're talking about. That really, that was a real turning point for me. Tell me something people don't know about Nick Kroll. Uh, Nick Kroll hates magicians. Does not like magic. I don't know if he hates magicians personally, but he doesn't like magic. Does not like to watch magic. I asked him, why don't you like to watch magic? He goes, because they trick you. It's a lie. And I said, well, yeah, that's the whole fun of it. But he does not like to be. Uh, seen. That's weird. Do you like magicians? Yeah, I do. Yeah. But I'm always amazed at how they did it. I'm blown away. Tell me something people don't know about Bill Hader. Um, let's see. Something people don't know about Bill Hader. Uh, well, as I said, he never enjoyed laughing and was always apologizing to me after he'd laugh at Stefan, even though it was a concentrated effort. Uh, and he's to, doing a serious show now, right? He's doing a series called Barry yeah. on HBO. It's so good. You should check it out. I've seen it. It's very good. Yes. And finally, on this segment. Tell me something people don't know about you. About me. Uh, I am positive I'm going to be assassinated. <laughs> My wife said to me, you mean killed? And I go, no, no, no. Assassinated. <laughs> she, goes, you, she goes, that just shows your ego that you think you'll be assassinated. You just get shot.
John will answer your many social media questions in our final segment. Kid Gorgeous is on Netflix now. Don't miss it. We'll have more after this. Back with John Mullaney. Kid Gorgeous is on Netflix, available now. Some social media questions for John Mullaney. Mi Young, if you could go back and take a joke or a bit out of a show, like one that ended up being more trouble than it was worth, which bit would it be? Well, I said when I was about uh, 26, I, I, I had just started dating my now wife. I had trouble uh, having her make friends with my female friends. It wasn't an immediate, they weren't immediately hitting it off. Um, one young woman said to my wife, it's so nice to meet you, sweetie. And only in, later did she go, she shouldn't have called me sweetie. And I said, why not? She goes, that's like calling me the C word. And I was like, my grandma calls me sweetie. I had no idea it was that hostile. <laughs> But I told a joke saying uh, Ocean's Eleven with women would never work because two would keep breaking off to talk shit about the other nine. <laughs> now, that's an okay joke. It's an okay joke. But uh, now they're making an Ocean's Eight. So yeah. I've been proven wrong. Brand Flake asks, how's Petunia doing? Petunia's great. Uh, we're following this Chinese medicine regime with her. She's really responding to it. How old is she? She's turned five yesterday. J23 McGuire. Who would win in a freestyle battle between you and Nick Crow? Me. Bands visit Broadway. Have you heard about J.J. Bittenbinder being pissed off about your special? And if he has, what do you think about it? I have heard about this because I checked the internet constantly to see if I'm being mentioned. J.J. Bittenbinder was a detective I talk about in the special. Uh, he was a detective that would come to my uh, grammar school when I was a kid and he would scare us about stranger danger. And he, he was a Chicago police officer, wore a three-piece suit, pocket watch, had a big handlebar mustache, uh, and I remember him wearing a cowboy hat. And he'd come in and he'd say, you're all gonna die! You're all alone out there. And this was, you know, 1980s America where everyone was afraid of kidnappers, so we had and to learn to fight And he's pissed off that. about you doing him? Uh, he was pissed off in the Chicago Tribune that I ever said that he wore a cowboy hat with a three-piece suit. And he didn't? I, my sense memory is that he did, but as any detective will tell you, eyewitness uh, recounts are not always reliable. Weekend Updated asks, what do your parents think of Kid Gorgeous? My parents were very excited with Kid Gorgeous. They've gotten used to, over the years, me making fun of them on stage, or let me rephrase, talking about them. Mr. Poopstash, was it hard to give up drinking? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Poopstash, do some research on alcoholism. Yes, it's... Uh, Did you I, go to AA, were you? Uh, 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 for a little bit, and then I became uh, a bit, bit more white knuckle. But I, I really, I, I think meetings are important. But I gave up all drinking and drugs when I was 23 years old. And haven't had any since? Uh, no. I've I... taken Xanax, and one time I had my wisdom teeth pulled, and I took a couple uh, hydrocodone. And then I said, this is too much fun, so I had to throw them away. Diane C. 017. Having now hosted Saturday Night Live, which do you prefer, hosting or writing? Um, hosting was a thrill, but I, I, if I could go back in time, nothing was more fun than being a writer there. Sir O'Keefe, are you interested in playing any serious dramatic roles in films or on stage? You seem like you could be a great actor. Wow. I, first off, I'm taken aback by the compliment. Um, and also, I have tried to act, so I seem like I could be a great actor. Seems mildly insulting. But, no, I never like to talk in don't want to's. Uh, if I was offered, you know, uh, Iceman cometh, uh, <laughs> I, I would do it. Um, I'd, love to, I'd love to be in Our Town. That was the first play I was ever in. I'd love to be in Our Town again. Henry Fonda was great in that. Yes. Spalding Gray, who's a big hero of mine, was great in that. Sinatra did the musical. He did the musical of Our Town? What was it called? Our Town. Oh, not like this swing in town? And Sammy Kahn wrote the lyrics. Can I tell you a quick Sam Giancana story? Yeah, I heard? sure. Okay. Uh, a mafia guy. Uh, Frank Sinatra is walking out of a restaurant with his friend and Sam Giancana, allegedly. And uh, Sam is talking to his friend, and as they're going through the door, Frank grabs him and he goes, You never walk through a door with Sam Giancana. <laughs> he goes first, and then we follow because people were after him. <laughs> Tony Accardo lived right near my dad in Oak Park growing up in Chicago. Boy, you know everything, Mulaney. Not like you. You've no. met all these people. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well. You be well. You be well. You're, uh, you're a big deal to me. You're a big deal to me. We didn't even get to talk OJ. You're a big you deal. You want to talk OJ? I talk OJ. That's the thing no one knows about me is I'm, I'm obsessed with OJ. Obsessed? Yes. You think he did it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> really? Yeah. Thanks to my guest, John Mulaney. Kid Gorgeous is available on Netflix. You can always find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.